Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from several thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Audrey. Hi everyone. And Alessio. Hello. And I'm your host, Fen. And we're taking a quick switch of the format today to talk about holidays and conventions, which is absolutely not the newest capitalist capitalist themed consumer role playing game from Wizards of the Coast, but instead <laughs> talk about conventions and board gaming and holidays. But before we get into that, uh, let's find out what's been up with you, Alessio. Oh, uh, quite a lot and not a lot, actually. So let's say uh, on one hand, I have been a lot of time working because summer is a time where everyone wants to get certification to be on the market for the for the winter. So uh, I have been crazy at work with demos, certification, help with customers and all, all the cool stuff everyone wants to do, like customer support, for, <laughs> fundamentally. <laughs> Uh, that aside, I got a lot of games because there are a lot of summer sales around. So I got Cryptid, which I always wanted. I was able to mm, do a couple quick plays about uh, at it. I got uh, a few of the Spiel des Jahres uh, nominees, namely Scout is the game I played most, of course. Uh, uh, we will have the Funny Animals game winning the Spiel des Jahres anyway. And, uh, well, uh, I got Mantis Falls in the end, so you convinced me. <laughs> and that's it. I guess not a lot at all. But uh, what about you, uh, Audrey? Uh, on low energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm a bit tired these days due to my uh, new job taking time and energy from me. Uh, but that's, I mean, that's how things are. Uh, so, yeah, lately, not really much in the board game inside for me. I just have plans to buy a uh, branch and club expansion for, uh, sp uh, for Spirit Island. Um, when I have finished to do, like, big expenses like I'm redoing my some of my PC parts but uh, yeah <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah not, not doing the G GPU just uh, CPU and um, and motherboard which is already and uh, which is a lot <laughs> which is already more than enough let's say um, yeah not other than that, mostly video games, uh, a sizable amount of Guild Wars 2, and I'm currently following the first time that we have, let's say, big streams by big uh, names in the Guild Wars 2 community for a new uh, instance, which is very hard, so it's a bit, uh, let's say, comparable to all the world uh, first on World of Warcraft. Uh, so yeah, five days and it still haven't been done. So that uh, for the people that know the Guild Wars 2 community is a timestamp for us. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's most of it. And oh yes, yeah, very, yes, very, 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 there is one thing on the board game front. It's where that I saw that uh, the King's Dilemma uh, board game will be on Kickstarter in various languages. Um, I think there is at least four or five languages, like French, I think German, uh, Spanish, Italian, uh, and maybe one or two others, uh, which I think is great when you can like, support directly the um, board game makers and also have the stuff in your own language and etc. Et so yeah, I think that's super cool. Yeah, um, you can already follow it on GameFound, right? Yeah, uh, you can. Uh, it's it's GameFound after there was Kickstarter, but um, I mean, cr cr let's say crowdfunding. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, it, it's like when you have a frigo in in, Fr in France, which was uh, a brand of refrigerator, so everyone says frigo, but it's a brand, not the name of the <laughs> item. So we, we keep saying Kickstarter uh, because of habit. <laughs> um. So yeah, I. Yeah, I don't think I have much more to say. Uh, it is it is on Kickstarter. They're going to be launching it. Yeah, the Queen's oh. Dilemma. 
Yeah. Okay. So you you were right. Yes. I <laughs> wish. I, 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 I like being right. Oh. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> I, w- I wish they changed to a different crowdfunding platform. Um, because well, we we won't go back into all of that. But Kickstarter need to kick up the uh at the keister to start behaving a bit better, <laughs> in my opinion, and take some responsibility and mm. not go in the direction they're going. But that's that's the subject we talked about in the past. We'll talk about again in the future. Oh, yes, my but, part. yes mm, but, but there is one thing I could have noted. Uh, I am very happy to see that the next, uh, the next, the current uh, Simon Kickstarter isn't doing as good as they used to. Yeah, they, uh, well, they picked a, <laughs> a game that managed a fair amount of controversy when it was released on PC. It's in a good state now. Uh, my partner yeah. really enjoys playing it. I didn't because I spent my time on the underside of the map whatever it was with my hardware setup every time i played i would get flipped onto the underside of the map and not be able to play um but yeah the, on top of that with the shipping issues with um, marvel although what did you expect considering how big that galactus statue is oh, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah um, that, 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 that uh, cyberpunk kickstarter i think is two or three uh, years late actually uh things would have probably been different uh, earlier but that's another matter <laughs> it's uh, kind of the opposite of the video game because the video game really needed to spend another couple of years you know in development not get pushed out when it did yeah, and yeah. the board game could have like come a little bit earlier maybe if they both met up at, like last year yeah, they could have been or, or exchanged or whatever, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, we'll have to see. Honestly, at this point, I think that Simon need to stop going to the Kickstarter well and behave like a publisher who's published a whole bunch of games and had a fair amount of success. But until the bubble pops, why wouldn't they keep going back there? Because and maybe it has, maybe it's yeah, popped. I hope yeah. so. Yeah, they're not, they're not, and they're not the only ones, to be honest. Even though I pledged for the uh, North Tom Saga Viking thing, uh, whichever was the last one, I don't remember. Uh, this is a series as well that should, that could stop going into Kickstarter, and we, we could rant uh, and make lists for hours, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could. It's nicer to just point at the games and go, "Hey, this is how it should be." And I've actually got one I'm going to be talking about later. That was a first game from a company that just started and I backed it on a whim and it's really good and it's everything that Kickstarter should have been used for. But I'll gush about that later. Um, For now, first of all, because my section uh, for myself, I'm going to be talking a fair bit about what I did on my friend's holidays. Yeah, uh, that's your good. holidays too. <laughs> yeah, you, what, no, no, I worked. I still yeah, work. Yeah, playing games is work for fans. Yeah, yeah play, I, I guess No, I'm wasn't... not just playing games. I didn't stop updating. I, I took one episode off from recording this and I still kept all of my other work going throughout because turns out my friends like to sleep in. So I get up at, what, seven o'clock and do like three, four hours of work and then maybe they roll in around lunchtime and we played. You know, okay. so yeah. Yeah. Audrey, did you ever fan evaluated games? That is work. I mean, when you work in the board game industry, <laughs> in the industry some somewhere in the board game industry, of course that is work. Let them do their work how they want. Oh, well, a couple of the games were they they were. I wouldn't have played them if I was playing for pleasure. I, <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, yeah but that's what I was going to say. Even though, yeah. even when you played games with your friends, you are still noting stuff, etc., uh, etc. Et so that is work. Well. Yep, yep. And I'm doing the teach, and sometimes I'm not even really playing. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah whatever you do, and you don't want to do it, that's work. Oh, you're doing the wrong job if that's the case. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what I was going to say. Uh... Okay, okay. I'm doing the wrong job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I, I, yesterday, um, I was watching Jeff Hooglin play Magic. I watch occasionally. Um, some people find him a bit of an abrasive personality because he's very, uh, like, he's very opinionated and very direct with his, should we say, left leaning agenda. And many Americans, like, let's face it, a left leaning American's kind of like mm-hmm. center left in U- Europe. But uh, he said, uh, if you don't enjoy your job, uh, maybe it's time to find a new job, but more importantly, if your hobbies aren't giving you pleasure, it's time for new hobbies. Oh, so. that, that, that's absolutely true. Uh, yeah. Actually, what I meant was that if uh, you are doing something that was not your idea, 
the, no, ma no matter if you enjoy it or not, p possibly you enjoy it, that's work because you are paid for it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, when you are self-employed, and depending how you are self-employed, it might be a bit different. <laughs> it is. You're not working for the man. Uh, in my case, I'm working for a whole host of people. And mm -hmm. if they don't like what I do, then um, I, I have to eat less in a month. Yeah. That, yeah. that that kind of creative job anyway it's all different it's true <laughs> yeah it, it's it's tough around for everyone right yeah now. it really yeah. is so yeah um but let's not worry about that let's uh file up and get our passes and we're going to talk a bit about conventions yeah there have been quite a lot of conventions yeah, because as I said, this uh, episode ends up being timestamped since I mentioned Guild Wars 2, so let's timestamp it even more. We are talking during the weekend where the uh, modeling convention, the World Model Explo, is taking place. Uh, there is also, I think, Paris et Ludique, which is the board gaming convention uh, in Paris as well, like right this weekend. And uh, generally, convention season is uh, summer and a bit of autumn anyway, so let's kick off convention se season. <laughs> Okay, so th this is kind of free form. So uh, uh, how do we start? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> do we want to talk? Well, let's kick things over to start with. Now, um, do we want to talk about like convention experiences ourselves? Should we start with um, first conventions? Because uh, oh, I yes. can say I can say I can only talk about conventions in the past. Um, yeah, my first convention was hilarious. <laughs> Go for it then. <laughs> Take it away. Set the scene. Uh, paint the picture. Uh, once upon a time. Yeah, my, my, yeah, that was once upon a time. That was 2017, I think. Um, summer 2017. Yes, uh, I was um, in, in um, a university school, my first year of university, and I ended up being a member of the role playing uh, club at the university. And every year they do end up doing a convention which takes place uh, in, inside the, the school, the, the rooms, etc, etc, are available during the whole weekend. And um, things are happening mostly during the night, so you end up at 8pm uh, being uh, drafting uh, which table uh, you want to play at, uh, and then uh, which tables you want to play at, and then being drafted to which table you are going to play. Um, and that's happening the Saturday, the Friday evening and the Saturday evening. So if you want, you can do two uh, different tables. Uh, the scenarios are all tailored to be uh, eight to 10 hours of playtime ish. And there is, uh, let's say, a little competition because if you have three tables of D&D &D and uh, let's say two tables of Vampire the Masquerade and then two other tables of, let's say, uh, Pathfinder, uh, each game uh, has competing tables and the ones that finish the scenario first end up winning a prize at the, uh, at the last day, the Sunday morning-ish. Uh, so that's very fun and I was part of the organizing team so I ended up making sandwiches and stuff like that for the people. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did That's convention stuff, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you, you know the people when they ask for a tuna brie sandwich, you know that their neighbors at the table are not going to look too much at them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I ended up playing the D&D game of, uh, I think it was Friday evening. And so I played the D&D game. It, it didn't happen. And, uh, well, uh, it didn't went very well due to some, let's say, issues with the DM and how the DM, um, let's say... Um, manage to the different experience level of the different players, but um, that's another matter. Um, <laughs> and we didn't understand the scenario, which we understood it only when there was the final uh, explanation, which in my opinion is a bit of shame. But anyway, so I played, I played, I ate, I think one or two Mars or Snickers bars during the evening, and uh, I went to bed at like maybe 7 or 8 a.m. Uh, I slept two hours. I don't know why that little. I got up like at 10 and I fell right away because I hadn't eaten enough during the night. <laughs> and when I saw that, when I told that on my friends uh, of the club, were like, but, but you should have eaten at least two sandwiches during the night. And I was like, 
what? Two sandwiches? That's a lot. <laughs> and so that's the history of how I had my first uh, and for now only uh, hypoglycemia of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so, that yeah, sounds that's, cool. Uh, yeah, that, that's not a very big deal, but that showed how much I didn't party actually <laughs> during yeah. my uh, first university. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it was it was very a very interesting event I think to be uh, behind the scene, uh, even though it was a small event. Uh, I really think that uh, for me that's something I like, and uh, I think that's something I try to do as well in the miniature uh, world in general, uh, organizing events, doing stuff to put people together, etc. And I. That was my first ex experience at it, so somehow it was still successful despite falling and despite uh, having that weird D&D uh, &D experiment. Wow, the D and D tournaments at conventions are the worst. Uh, <laughs> I, I have the, the the worst the worst memories about uh, conventions are all about the D and D tournament. Either because uh, you are part of a team which assembled just uh, just at the moment, uh, because you are running with pre-made character sheets. Uh, mostly the adventure is very very scripted and there are a lot of yeah. dungeon masters and they don't know what they're doing that they were uh, they were a mess basically uh, i have to say modern role playing games uh, at least uh, have a way to encode a quick experience uh, which is much fitter for a convention <laughs> Yeah, a, a few years later, I went to other conventions and I tried other uh, games. Uh, one of them was Night. I don't know if it's known outside of France, but I know it's French. Uh, it's like um, you are playing basically Space Marines, but in a more uh, our world, uh, <laughs> not, not that uh, futuristic uh, setting. Um, and I was like playing a cyber pop and that was... Uh, much better and more funny and etc. On the playing and scenario part, it was really just that very first experience, which was. <sighs> yeah, come to think of it, it's a bit similar to the Italian scene, but I think that Italians do mix and match of a lot of stuff. Um, uh, f for instance, if you go to an Italian convention, you usually get there. For, for example, you want to go to a board game convention. You uh, usually choose between uh, Lucca at October, November or uh, Modena, which uh, had a lot of changes uh, of, of time frame during COVID, but is basically on late May. And you go there, you find people playing board games, then uh, uh, you you get uh, new stuff, uh, you get a lot of Italian publisher, of Italian translation of old stuff uh, and everything and uh, uh, you find, uh, you always find this group where there is tabletop gamers of ga Games Workshop games everywhere. You find, you find half the convention is there, then there is this table with these guys. We are, discuss, we are discussing rules. Uh, oh, I have this white dwarf excerpt which says I can do that. Oh, no, you don't. And they, but they, they spend all the time, two days playing that same game you find there when you found them the, the first time. Then you go a bit, uh, you, you go a bit outside the perimeter of the convention and you find the magic player exchanging stuff. <laughs> Always magic players exchanging stuff. And the, the only thing that drives away a magic player is a comic book fan. Because you always... you Even if it's not a comic book uh, convention at all, you always f find people selling comics. I don't know why you always find people selling comics. But they could speak together about art. I mean, the magic art yeah. books are great. <laughs> yeah. There was a magic time uh, in uh, 1999 where, where you could have comic books about Magic the Gathering. That was ma that was magic. <laughs> yeah, they still do those comics. Yeah. Um, and when it comes to art, if you want a particular wrinkle, if you get a magic card signed by the artist, <laughs> it's worth less. Wow, because it's Ex not With mean. some exceptions. Yeah, yeah, it's because you generally can't prove it's a, the actual artist's signature. Uh, there are, as I said, some exceptions, such as uh, Christopher Rush, who um, passed away. His signatures have now had value, which is that classic morbidity of, oh, look, the artist is now dead. Now they're worth something. Mm. Oh, wow, he, wonderful. He did, that's, that's he so did 
he did also paint the original Black Lotus piece, so there's yeah. a little bit more to it than that, but still, yeah. <laughs> and that's basically the convention experience for me. My, my, first, my first convention was, uh, I think, back then in 1997. I, I went uh, to Lucca for comics, actually, not board games. Then uh, I just stumbled into a demonstration of uh, Warhammer Quest, which was basically out that year, actually one year earlier, but uh, you don't get that soon in Italy. Uh, Talk about dating things. What is that, 96, 97? 97, yes. It was 97, I was uh, 15, (laughs) and uh, I I, I went to look at comics. I stumbled upon uh, a demonstration of Warhammer Quest in Luca Games, and I actually spent the entire day there. (laughs) <laughs> and I you... had to come back home because it's one day conventions for you kids. That's, <laughs> that's, when, that, that's when you fell into the pot. <laughs> well, that's actually... like yeah. that. That's ten or eleven years before I ever played Warhammer Quest. <laughs> no, I actually I, I started playing Hero Quest because in the nineties, actually in the ninety or in the eighty nine, I, I don't remember exactly the year. My father gifted me for Christmas. The, the the original Hero Quest box. So mm. I started playing that. I forgot about it. Then uh, when I saw Warhammer Quest, I I was like, uh, I kind of remember these characters and this stuff and these actually these rules. They are a lot. Uh, they look a lot like something I already played. They were a bit different, but well, that's it. Uh, only an embarrassingly big amount of time later I understood that the gargoyle miniature of HeroQuest was actually a bloodthirster <laughs> yeah yeah well it's a bit smaller than they are these days <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they, yeah. They, they got vitamins uh, vitamins I think they've been the creatine and the <laughs> protein powder and yeah. probably a bit of steroids goodness knows yeah, probably that, that's the, 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 the powders we get these days. Either that or they've all got a huge case of gigantism and it's never stopped because, I mean, how big are they now? They're, they're, um, they're huge, those models. I, I, I think, I, I don't actually know the base size, but it's the big oval one now. So they are huge, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of bigger than a Dreadnought. Yeah, yeah, which which brings me to my most recent uh, experience of conventions, which is uh, double, which has mini painting ex- uh, conventions. Whoa, let's talk to play painting. Here, yeah. here we go. Before we do, twelve oh. inches tall. Oh, that, oh, that's the height on them. So thirty centimeters. So mm. that, that, that's that's still smaller than Tulu of that my die. Yeah, or Galactus. Yeah. When, when when do you stop calling them miniatures? Well, once um, I guess Kingdom Death gets involved in the arms race, which they are already, and good luck making a bigger miniature than Galactus, though. So. Yeah, yeah. W- we'll see with the Gambler, then we'll see with uh, Ivory Dragon, then we'll see with Saturn, uh, if it ever gets completed, because uh, I only saw Rezi of that. Well, in the latest newsletter, they announced their pinup painting competition. Let's say that I am a bit miffed about that. Uh, anyway, and <laughs> they said that one of the prize would be a one uh, eight size pinup. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are definitely going there. I, I yeah, think well. the, the king's man that was at Gen Con was one eighth uh, scale. No, that was one to one. one yeah, they one. one to one. That was yeah, one as big as a person. Yeah, you've, got one to one. Wow. you've got you've got to spend that money for the conventions on a printer that can print like life size <laughs> statues, and then instead of maybe printing an outfit for somebody to cosplay in, just 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 print the statue. Yeah, that's a statue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just 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 a, although uh, they they're not doing conventions this year, which is yeah. um, yep yep definitely I. Yeah, well, there was that one chap who said he'd be very unpleasant if they did uh, if they did go to convention and Agreed. yeah, yeah and, that's, he... and that's 
And that's very funny because uh, 2022 is a very, uh, let's say, strange, complicated, or I don't know uh, the exact word for conventions because uh, there are some conventions where people are still worried about going or not going and other conventions like the World Model Expo right now, uh, which is more like everyone has to go because it's been three <laughs> years we've been dealing with one. It's either uh, one or the other. And yeah, it's it's people really should be still wearing masks and being cautious about going i mean one of my role playing group had to miss last week because he caught covid uh i, I think second time so oh. you know like a mutation of covid or a recurrence of it he's vaccinated and everything but he was yeah it floored him he's just pleased it wasn't long covid which is really bad yeah that's um, already a relief not to have long covid yeah. yeah there's a lot of people very concerned about the uk ge uh, you know the uk convention yeah Mm, that that didn't have any mandates i think it's great people are getting back out there um we definitely you know you can't let interesting times continue to keep you indoors and away from everyone um and other things are starting to take precedence as well over this whole uh, i don't know Mess. canyon the canyon we're being all being shoved through at high speed on our rafts to use a, a bit of a metaphor um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I myself, I haven't been to a convention since I stopped uh, judging magic tournaments. That's the <laughs> last time I used to go. I used to go as a, a magic judge. I was one of Wales's only level two magic judges, which meant I supposedly knew enough to be able to be involved in Grand Prix and the bigger events that they had. Um, but it was... I, the time I got qualified was the same time that somebody broke into my flat and stole all my magic collection. Oh no! <laughs> yeah, which the, the stupidest thing is the the bit that bites me is I I, I probably I think I've talked about some podcast before, but <laughs> my the first like things I ever got was a bunch of knocked down, marked off Mirage um, starter packs, um, like long after Mirage had finished. But like, so I see Mirage art and I still go like, oh, that reminds me of my childhood. Um, even though I think like, you, you, I not... think it was, I think it was Odyssey or something was out at the time. Um, actual set was out when I got, I got them very marked down. But anyway, Weather I opened, light, a, I opened a Lion's Eye a Diamond. Yeah, Weatherlight was the third yeah. thing in the circle. I opened a Lion's Eye Diamond in that and I just started collecting Mirage. I like the African style of art and the theming and the artists they're using. Um, and so I just collected them. And I collected them when people wanted 50 pence for them, a pound, a piece. Um, they're six, they're five to six hundred dollar cards now. And so I had a whole collection of those stolen. Um, but at the time, the thing that hurt the most was I had a f like full play sets of dual lands. Um, they were still quite expensive at that time. Um, I'd just been hoovering up old cards. Uh, but you know that's what kicked me into stopping playing was I I was away for a, a Pro Tour qualifier and um, I got to the finals and I conceded because I wasn't going to be able to travel because I wasn't old enough to travel um, and then well I was old enough to travel then I wasn't going to travel because of university exams um, mm -hmm. So I conceded to a teammate of mine, uh, another guy, and uh, he 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 took that, and I took all the prizes, and I got home, and that's when everything had been pinched. So I was left. They'd known I'd gone to was going to a GP, <laughs> and um, it's suspected that it was one of the um, one of the in uh, what they call them, like work experience kids. He was a bit rough. He was from a bad neighbourhood. And um, we know <laughs> that he organised a robbing of the shop where I worked during my time at university. Like, um, there wasn't very good security there. So the yeah. fingers pointed at him um, but or his mates because he did know where I live. He, he knew I had cards and stuff. But amazingly, they never stole my... my um, they didn't steal my Necromunda or my <laughs> Warhammer Quest, so I still got those. But this yeah. is... This is not my convention experiences. So um, I I don't have a great memory of most of my conventions because I was quite young when I went to a lot of them. Um, the main thing I remember is that for a while, I kept running into Andrew Harmon, who's a British <laughs> author. He was a British author. He does, he, I think he, he, he's involved in publishing or designing of board games now. Um, mm -hmm. And the first time I ever ran into him, 
he was sitting at the convention by the desk by himself. Um, and I wandered past with like sticking out of my bag um, one of his books. And it just turned out I'd just be reading. And I kept running into him into conventions afterwards. So we used to just like sit around a bit and chat. Um, never about his books. He signed them all for me, but we never really talked about them. Uh, and, and we just like laughed about the other weird stuff that was going on. Like, people dressed up in crazy cosplay because that wasn't much of a thing, I think, at least in the UK at that time. Um, so that's, it's a big part of what I remember. Uh, beyond that, it's going to, it's constantly like tournaments, running tournaments or playing in magic tournaments. And it just, you don't, you don't, or Doomtown, I played a bit of Doomtown as well. Um, mm -hmm. but as a card game player, you're there and you're just there for the cards. So you're looking for the traders. You're looking to see what good deals are out, whether you can get cards for decks. Um, and then playing, and it's so exhausting. Like a magic tournament, if you make the top four, which I usually did uh, at that time, um, it was it was hours. Sometimes we played seven seven rounds of Swiss, and those were fifty minutes a round. So that's pretty much including all the messing about between rounds and overtime and everything. An hour and a half a round. So you'd start at like nine in the morning and maybe you'd be approaching the finals at like five. Mm -hmm. And and it's, you know, magic's pretty, pretty mentally intensive. There goes so the entire day. Yeah, it does. It's just, just gone. And, you know, you're just trying to grab a little bit of food during the gaps. Mm -hmm. um, and it was no easier on the judging side because there's just so much work to do on that. I, d I don't know what it's like now. I wouldn't want to do it again. I do not. I do not recommend being a magic judge to anyone. <laughs> The perks are terrible. Like you, you do better as just somebody who turns it to a tournament and wins. Uh, on the <laughs> other end, you can call yourself "I am a magic judge." Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to go into some internet or, or, uh, argument now and go. Oh, I'm going as a magic judge. It's because like I got no idea, uh, and, and also that appeal to authority is not. Uh, it's, it's a bit tactless, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, the, ju the judging talk gets me to a very fun exper experience I had. Uh, I had like arrived in the city where I am uh, now uh, a few months back, and there was a um, war gaming uh, convention, and I went there and I bought some D&D book, but that's not a big issue. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go and see. And well, there's no game I play at the tournament, uh, but I met a few friends and we did some Necromunda thing i teamed up with someone since i did not know anything about that and just participated a bit and the second day i went back and i was like oh i'm going to paint so i had my uh, lamp i had my brushes i had my paints i had one uh, model which was a kingdom death model and i set up in a corner and started to paint and i was uh, quite close to the war machine um or holes. I don't know for me these two games are the same and actually, they're more or less the same. They're yeah, different, actually, but same true. setting, <laughs> slightly different models. I personally prefer hordes aesthetically because it's you know animalistic. But yeah, they're, it's it's all the same yeah. system. So, and world. so I was quite next to these tables, and at some point someone. Uh, approached me and I was like oh uh, so I see you are painting and I was the only one person painting uh, and uh, we have a painting contest uh, for the armies of the warmer horde uh, games so would you judge that please <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, I mean, okay. <laughs> and yeah, out of nowhere, I became from a painter just there to hang out with some friends. Uh, I became of the official judge of a painting competition that day. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I like. Uh, we A bit more for the mini painting uh, conventions, it's that as it's, it's a more tight knit world uh you end up more chatting with the people that you know and that you've known online for years but doing only that during the whole convention um a bit more than with the board gaming uh, um part and i think that's what's the that's what that's what sets uh, these two type of conventions apart and that's why i prefer the mini painting ones it's because it's the time to meet up and to hang out more than the time to try new games and discover new stuff and that's why i like as well the opportunity to take uh, one or two things you have painted uh, for a miniature convention and just yeah 
go around with a friend and say, oh, yes, I remember when you showed this one online. And, oh, I see how it's uh, in person now. And I think that's a bit more oriented to the social um, parts uh, of the community, especially the Monte San Savino show, because there are no uh, or barely any selling booth. Uh, Monte San to... Savino. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just have the rooms with the miniatures and uh, there is a workshop room where you have some uh, small classes or demonstrations. Um, I will have to speak about one demo uh, I witnessed. Um, and there are maybe two or three booths to sell stuff and that's it. So the, the real goal is just, yeah, talk to each other and exchange. And I think that's really different and that's what I love in this world. Yeah, I, I am saying this to benefit the Italians listening, actually. Monte San Savino is uh, that place oh. which actually exists uh, on the exit of the highway called the Monte San Savino. There's a, an entire place there. <laughs> because and, and you can it, have restaurants with very nice uh, cacio e pepe yeah, pasta. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you, you know, because Monte San Savino is like uh, uh, an important... Uh, 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 rest area in the highway so everyone knows by that name and they are surprised there's an actual town called Monte San Savino after that so... <laughs> and, and, and the town itself is interesting to visit so if someone wants to go to the uh, show for the model painting part and their partner wants to visit the town it's perfect yeah and you, you, you get good wine since you are in Tuscany there's an <laughs> yeah. entire viticulture uh, set there so... <laughs> Yeah, and, and so that demo that I witnessed there, it was uh, 2017, I think, uh, November. <laughs> and uh, the demo was actually a speed painting uh, event uh, organized by Alfonso Giraldes, which is uh, mostly called by the name uh, Banshee in yeah. the miniature world. And he organized so that speed painting. So two hours come and everyone has a very, very tiny uh, demon bust uh, to paint. And so there are a few colors spread on the tables, like but uh, maybe four or five colors maximum. Um, five pots maybe of each but like yeah you had all the primaries and maybe one uh maybe one brown basically <laughs> uh and uh he gave water to just some people and he said yeah the others just manage and so the people were using spit to <laughs> thin their paints and at some that point that's the only way you... Yeah, that's I mean, the only it, medium it, you use. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was crazy. And at some point, Banshee was going around all the people and he said, hey, but I mean, yeah, yes, you can have water. And so he grabbed uh, the glasses of water and he totally dunked the glasses of water inside the uh, plates that were being used as toilet. And yeah, now the glaze is just managed. And oh, then you all give your miniature to the person to your left. So you get a new miniature. So try to imagine what the person uh, was trying to do and complete that. And oh... Um, 10 minutes later, I'll now give it back to the person to your right and they're that... going to try to combine what you do and it was a hot mess. And at the very end, he picked up all the miniatures and gave them to the audience. It was... That's a fake unfair. artist goes to New York <laughs> applied to mini painting. Yes. No, uh, that's that's John Kramer levels of torture, that is. <laughs> uh, anyway... it, it, it was a mess, but that was, yeah, the community thing. Okay, a, a cool trick for everyone who doesn't know anything about miniatures like me and wants to actually pretend to be a judge of miniature painting. If the miniature has white, you just say, oh, that's pretty cool, but your white looks a bit grainy. Please thin your paints. Chalky, it always chalky, works. Ch ch <laughs> chalky, chalky, chalky. Chalky, chalky, yeah. <laughs> And then if you want to look just a bit smarter, you say not enough contrast. That's great. <laughs> you, you, you are the staff. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, I mean, then that's still true. That's both sad and both true. But, yeah, often contrast is a bit thing and overlooked. And, yeah. Okay. Th th that's a lot of talking. Uh, mm. Do we want to it pass uh, over some news? No, before we finish, no? <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if I've shared this story before, but I'm going to share one story from 2003. It's Ooh. not strictly speaking a convention, uh, but it was a magic event in London. <laughs> and for people who do know anything about the history of magic, Revan it's, Kello? Oh, it's sorry, the sorry. birth of an entire deck archetype. <sighs> wow. So um, it is 2002-2003. Uh, at this time, I believe it's Tempest Block and uh, I think Onslaught that are in um, 
print. Uh, it's a time of Rebels. Rebels mm-hmm. is one of the dominant decks, which is mm-hmm. very powerful. Uh, now, as a uh, member of the Welsh contingent, I didn't need to go there. Um, I went along just to support a load of other people and to play in some side events, um, just for the sake of it. Uh, at the time, you know, university and... No, it's pre-university? Yeah, pre-university. But I had time to just, uh, you know, go to London with some friends. Um, and one of whom was a teacher, so I was allowed to go. Brilliant. Yeah. Uh, we stayed um, at Hampton Court Palace which is fancy, uh, because one of the guys who was going to be playing in the English Nationals, his mother was the caretaker for the place. So um, he actually lived in these, what was the servants' wing. So we got to spend our time there. Um, and we were sitting around and they were all trying to figure out what decks they were going to submit for the constructed portion of the English Nationals. And uh, there were two particularly uh, famous British um, magic players, who are John Ormerod and Dan Paskins. Now, um, I don't know if they still play, uh, but they were both, like, well, John Ormerod was well-known in the UK for being a very, very deep, like, thoughtful player. Dan Paskins is well-known for being one of the best aggressive players in the United Kingdom. Uh, And what there was was John Ormerod's uh, little box, um, and he just had a box of, like, decks that he put together, and it was just a thing, like, they were all the current format... And they would just chuck these in and like the testing gauntlet for other decks to run against. And Dan Paskins is like, I don't want to play Rebels. I'm, I don't want to play White. I'm just, everybody's going to be playing White. I don't want to play White. Uh, what am I going to do? The, I, don't, I don't really want to play Black and I'm not keen on the others. I want to play something Red. And John, just to shut him up, tosses him this small deck and goes, look, this is red, all right? It's a stupid red deck. It plays really like small little creatures and burn spells and it deals damage to you and your opponent at the same time. And Dan went, yes, please. Dragon like, well, oh. Paladin Ball, all this stuff. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Red, it's got goblins in it. It's got jackal pups in it. It goes fast. Yes, please. Um, these are creatures that in this day and age, they, they're not even good enough. They don't, wouldn't pass the test. Um but to to like kind of sell it, John was like, this is like the Sly deck, which was a deck that was a few years old and used, I think, Fire Blast for its finisher. He's like, it's, it's a similar principle, but it's way worse. And so Dan broke it out and played against um, John and won. And everyone was a bit flabbergasted because it was such a handy, like thorough thrashing that Sir John like played a few more games and Dan kept winning. Uh, and he switched to pull out um, the Rebel deck, like the best deck in the format, um, and just lost and kept losing because this deck would make these tiny little creatures that were getting about five, six, seven, eight points of damage. <laughs> and they would be dealing damage to both players. And then Dan would go over the top with spells that just went, you take four and I take four, which is, you know, 20% of your life total. No, 20? Yeah, 20%. 20%. Yeah, yeah. yeah the total it, of 20 it, it... It goes fast like that. Yeah, yeah. So at this point now, we'd all stopped our testing and we were just watching this. And I do not remember exactly who said it first, but somebody went, what the hell is going on? And Dan and John simultaneously looked at that person and went, Red Deck wins. And (laughs) that became the mantra for the evening. This this stupid little deck would beat things again and again and again. And at the end of it, there would somebody be exasperatedly going, Red Deck wins. Um, It was so bad that the other people who were testing at the time and were taking Rebels, one of whom was playing my deck, put Circles of Protection Red in their sideboard, which was like unheard (laughs) of because they were more and more people in the group who were going. And there was like uh, three of us from Wales who we weren't involved. We were lending decks and then the rest were taking part. About half of them switched to this deck, uh, 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 yeah. and the others were really nervous about it. So, so basically, what you are saying is that you were part of a meme right before meme, uh, let's say, time existed. Yeah, a meme, <laughs> yeah, somewhat. Uh, I have uh, to say, in 1997, uh, Circle of Protection Red in the sideboard, if you played white, was actually a thing that was done. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was done in 97, but in, yeah. in 2002, 2003, it wasn't because Red of Red course. Burn had fallen to the side. People yeah. weren't thinking about this level of. It's it's a deck that sacrifices everything. Um, resources, <laughs> all its resources, its life total, its cards, its creatures, it doesn't care as long as they convert into damage. Um, and that's the principle that all of the Go Fast Red decks are built on now. Um, as it turns out, Dan Paskin's 
made at least the top eight, I think top four with the deck, and it didn't win only because it went up against the rebel deck that had been constructed with my cards and had four circles of protection red in the sideboard. <laughs> so that is the way in Red Deck Wins was born. And for a long time, Dan Paskins and John Ormrod spent a lot of sort of memeing, building mystiques about like how the deck came into being. <laughs> and that's actually what happened. I was there. Uh, it was bizarre and it's really weird seeing to this day that the archetype is still called Red Deck Wins. <laughs> you know, and I hate it. I hate playing against a deck. It's a big part of the reason I stopped playing Magic Arena because of how much that that platform rewards aggressive decks, and you don't get more aggressive than red. Uh, so yeah, that's um. Sorry, yeah. Magic. I'm really sorry. I didn't do that much. I wasn't that involved. <laughs> I was just present, but that's that's where it came from. <laughs> so yeah, that's my other convention related story except for what we're going to move on to now, which is having a convention at home. Yeah. Yeah, So, or a board game holiday. Uh, yeah. Some, so some people do this. They have like a... I, I read about um, one group of people who they're all in their 30s and 40s, and they will all, for one weekend, they'll go away to a cabin or somewhere like that, and they'll just shut off their phones and they'll play board games for that weekend. And then yeah. maybe have Monday off to recover, which I think is a really cool idea. We had something organized like that uh, with uh, David being the mastermind morph of in the, with the Kingdom Death uh, community people. And uh, due to COVID, etc., we had to delay, delay, and then some people were not available. Ah. And, we can, and we ended up canceling. Uh, that meet and greet at the German villa. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yeah, maybe one day it will uh, reappear. But um, Yeah, maybe. Yeah. yeah so... I had uh, two, uh, two of my friends, two of the guys from my role-playing group, were finally like, hey, uh, COVID's over enough, uh, we're fully vaccinated, we feel comfortable enough to travel. <laughs> so they both, there was three of them considering, uh, one of them he couldn't make it because he was just starting a new job, but the other two both came over. And they visited for seven days. Um, taking off travel, we basically had six days to play games and sightsee. As I mentioned near the top of this episode, they were a bit bad at getting up in the mornings. It's because Diablo Immortal launched. Uh, let's not talk about that horribly exploitative piece of rubbish. But uh, <laughs> I have... Oh, Diablo Immortal. Okay, I wasn't sure I heard uh, the, the, the name of the game properly, but yeah, let's not talk yep. about that. Yeah, yep, yep. <laughs> Dia Diablo Immortal, yes. That's a whole other subject that people have talked for hours and hours about, and it's really fascinating. But I'm instead going to briefly walk through all of the 20 games that we played with a, like either we've talked about this in a previous podcast or maybe a little bit about it, and I'm going to end with... The games, two games, one of them I'll probably revisit, that um, I would really like to recommend from the whole experience. But many of these are going to be recommendations, and one of them is going to be controversial. Oh. So, um, we played Tiny Towns, and I've said about that. Uh, we played Corrosion, which is a really interesting little engine builder, where you build an engine. So, you have an engine builder <laughs> card game about building an engine... Half of the engine has like three elements that you replace through the game so it changes what it does. The other half of the engine has a big wheel that you turn and um, all the pieces on it eventually corrode and you lose them. So you've got this constantly rebuilding, reconstructing card engine that you're doing through the whole thing. It's, it, it's the first board game design from this particular designer. I promised myself I would remember his name. And I've forgotten. Of course, I hear the keyboard. <laughs> yep, right, there's the keyboard. Click, click, click. I did. Uh, Stefan Bauer. Actually, I did remember his name, but I wasn't yeah. confident about uh, it. Uh, and, and that's when I have to do some kind of uh, professional. Um, um, I don't. I, I cannot find the exact word, but what type of corrosion liquid? Um... <laughs> Uh, we we don't know. <laughs> there's it, it, there's a bunch of like nice looking cardboard um, cogs that come in different colours, and then there's a section that's chrome. Uh, whatever it is, this fact uh, it's it's some kind of factory, and everything breaks really really quickly. Um, so uh, rust of some kind. But it is it's 
it's got the bit of glory to Rome in that when somebody plays something for their turn, you do have the options to follow by playing your own workers, which I like. It means you're not spending your turn staring at your phone or drifting off. You do have to pay attention, but you can't always be able to capitalise on other people's moves. You have to think about it a bit because you have to play a worker of the same colour and higher value to follow. So you're left there going, do I play this this one or not? I love, as well, all the engineers, all the cards, the workers, female. All of them. Ooh. Love it. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to see what's done next. There's more I could talk about with this. It is, it's a chunky game to play. It's um, a lot of brain burning and thinking and takes a while to get used to. And the engine feels very stop-starty. It's not like one of those games where your engine builds and builds and builds and then suddenly it just goes, and now I do the thing and the game's over. This is constantly reconfiguring and trying to make the best of every single turn. But I loved it. Really good. It was a bit of a hit. We played Maracaibo from Alexander Pfister. A classic. Um, yeah, a classic. First time playing it. Uh, <laughs> it was, of course, a complete mess. Um, but I could see it has things in common with Great Western Trail. Yeah. Um, it felt very much like we knew what we were doing by the time we were on the last lap of the game. And it was oh. like, oh. Um, but I'm going to revisit it some more because it's got a solo mode. It's got a little like unfolding campaign mode. Um, I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, I don't know if I like it more than Great Western Trail. But uh, it's definitely very, very crunchy. Like, absurdly crunchy. So, uh, thumbs up. But um, that was hard work learning it. Yeah, I have still to win my first game of Great Western Trail. I hope that BGA adaptation will let me win one time or another. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think for myself, Great Western Trail clicked better, but that might be because I got to watch Shut Up and Sit Down play it before I played it myself. <laughs> um, whereas Maracaibo, we had to learn from first principles. Yeah, um, yeah we'll see. Uh, we played uh, Makikoro 2. Mm -hmm. So the Machikoro series is a light dice rolling engine builder um, where the main gimmick is that you get to choose whether you throw 1d6 or 2d6 on a turn. Um, and so you can actually build an engine that goes 1 to 6 or you can have an engine that goes like 2 to 12 or somewhere in between. It's very vicious. You're constantly taking money from each other player, sometimes even taking their cards. Uh, but it's a light kind of over in 20 minutes kind of game. Um, the main thing to note is that Machikoro 2 is like an evolved, superior version of the original, and there's no reason to own both. Uh, if you do look at it, it's cute, it's Japanese, it's very enjoyable, um, but it is mean. Uh, get the second one, or maybe get the legacy game, but there's no need to have more than that. Like, I own both, and I really don't need the first one. Uh, we played Root Marauder. Um, I played as the Lord of Hundreds, and it was incredibly miserable. Um, <laughs> the Lord of Hundreds, as it turns out, it's a snowball -y faction, um, and I got completely messed up by the Hirelings, because the, you can't generate any victory points as the Lord of Hundreds from territory control unless there's no opposing figures in there, and the Hirelings oppose you. So uh, I had a horrible time. Also, there was a Vagabond in the game, and the Vagabond like took... Three out of four of the uh, the tools, instead of a speed of splitting 50 50, the trouble is because the Lord of 100 collects at the start of their turn. So I get in position to take it, and then the Vagabond swarms in and scoops it up and wanders off again. Um, ultimately, uh, the game we played was Vagabond, Lord of Hundreds, Corvids, and <laughs> the Moles. And the Moles won because. Um, the vagabond kept on like uh, stimming me because I had lots of I had lots and lots of figures on the board because that's what the game that's what the Lord of Hundreds does. But I was making like two three victory points a turn compared to the mole and the corvids and especially the vagabond that was nothing. But the vagabond player just he couldn't get it in his head that I wasn't winning because he just saw the table presence. <laughs> Whereas the moles are like very small table presence and they have a lot of points off the board, but you've got to attack them to stop their point generation. Um, he so essentially it came down to me having to police the vagabond, uh, which I did with glee because he'd ruined my game for me. Um, and the moles won, which was my partner, and they were very happy. Um, but I was like, well, diplomatically, you didn't mess with me. 
uh, you could see I was struggling to make points. You could see I was on like three points and everyone else was on 15. And the Vagabond was still going, Then is the threat. Then is the threat. And I'm like... Yeah. I, I broke it down to him how many points a turn I was making. And he still wouldn't believe me. He thought I was like, I'd lie about <laughs> it. I've never lied to him in a board game ever, except when we played Express de- Deception games. Because I don't want to win by cheating or telling someone wrong information. That's no fun. But um, I wish I'd played the Badgers. And On the other hand, I love the Hirelings. Great. I like the new draft setup, but I'm never playing with the Vagabond or the Woodland Alliance ever again unless the final edition <laughs> changes the rules. I don't get why I do not get victory points for smashing the Vagabond's tools. What, there's no benefit to, to the Lord of Hundreds attacking the Vagabond, but yet I'm required to police him because no one else can. Yep. Yeah. Vagabond sucks. And, and, the, uh, and these kits uh, is every Cold War game. Uh, in the end, uh, they kept bashing at me, but I couldn't convince them that I wasn't winning. In the end, someone else won, but I was very happy about it. Mm. <laughs> that, yeah, that, I, could I, I just... Pamir, that could be Spamir, that could be Oth, that could be Ruth. Yeah, well, the thing is, I just, I just believe the design of the Lord of Hundreds is wrong. It's a pub-stomping design. Mm. Either you win hard and crush the heck out of people, or you dither around not doing anything, and there's no in-between, and I don't think that's enjoyable, and they have zero interaction with the vag- with the Vagabond, the same as the um, lizard folk. The uh, lizard cults just suck against the Vagabond. <laughs> so, uh, I wish I'd played badges. Yeah, uh, one thing about the Marauder expansion, I think that Ireling and the advanced setup uh, and the landmarks, which is not exactly the Marauder expansion, are the best addition uh, of the expansion. I, I, I play uh, a lot of two-player routes, route, and uh, we didn't use any bot with our links. It was yeah. very, very cool. It was yeah, yeah. beautiful and liberating. It was uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I, got, I got nothing but positive things to say about the landmarks. They're interesting. The hilings, they're interesting. Yeah. I just, I'm tired of the Vagabond and I'm tired of the Wooden yeah. Alliance. <laughs> And I, re- I want them to redesign the Vagabond as like a party of, say, four units <laughs> and, and people to actually get points for attacking the Vagabond. Like, <laughs> but we're not here to talk about Root Endlessly. Um, it is, it's a game I love and it's a game I find to be very problematic as well. So <laughs> We also played Arkham Horror. Um, we played the Edge of Earth campaign. The- really good. Um, very expansive huge it's got like 10 scenarios but you don't play all of them when you go through a run so it's got a bit of branch and replayability uh i've said before i love the new distribution model where you get all of the campaign in one box you get all of the investigator stuff in another box we played as harvey walters stella clark uh Winith- uh, winithrop um <laughs> the pilot <laughs> and i played i forget her name but she's the uh, mechanic from edge of earth um, and we had a great time. Uh, it was challenging. It was interesting. Uh, we also played the um, uh, murder mystery standalone one, which I've forgotten the name of right now. But that's that's the best of all. Like of all of the standalone scenarios, it's amazing. It's got like ten different ways it can play out. So Arkham Horror gets like a big thumbs up from me. But it is it's more accessible to buy in now you can get the core game and then you can buy the campaign separately um but you you, you will find spend. yourself being tempted towards getting more and more of yeah, it yeah <laughs> like, yeah like like the one about Lord of the Rings. Uh, that's, yeah. They, they did a, a lot of work streamlining everything and getting you ac- early access to stuff uh, so that you don't have to play a lot of boxes, but in the end, you will buy everything anyway. <laughs> so it's an addictive lifestyle game. No card game ever manages to be anything other than uh, <laughs> cardboard crack. Uh, okay, next one we played was Dream Crush. That's the very first game we actually played. Um, it is a light party game where you have a bunch of random cards dealt up that have photo photo portraits of individuals with their name and then over five rounds you will have a scenario and then you'll learn a fact about each of the potential crushes Um, so for example you might learn that your crush wants to start up a beef jerky farm that's their dream (laughs) or you might learn as we did that their secret fantasy is to be an adult baby. 
<laughs> so <laughs> it's pretty weird. It's pretty bizarre. But the fun part of it is you are to pick your like ideal crush out of the choices. And then you have to guess what everyone else has picked. And you'll do this every round. And the winner is the person who gets the most right on their guesses. Uh, and it's kind of fun because you, you, you end up discussing why you think somebody likes this particular person, why they would be their dream crush, just to have them go, nope, nope, that's not it at all. That's, so, that's not... so basically you're saying that this game is like Dixit, except you have to take care not to kink shame. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> no kink. Dixit, you can't kink shame in Dixit either, you know. Yeah. If somebody's got a thing for that rabbit on that card, that's their business. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it, 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 my only thing I think is not so good about it is you only have a choice of three um, different crushes in the standard rules, and we often find people house rule to have four or five because it makes it with three it's quite easy to just have a random stab in the dark uh, and and be right a third of the time. The yeah. more you have, the more difficult it is. I wish the base game did have just like five. But we had an immensely fun time, especially just the personalities of the characters unfolding. Very fun. We had this guy who was <laughs> he was like, oh, um, he 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 like he's DJs at a radio station in Deep House. I think it was to start with. And we were like, OK, that's fine. But we looked at him and he was like um, he was he was lifting, you know, like literally weightlifting in the picture. We're like, OK, well, not not really the great. And then it's um, his second thing was that he. He made money in real estate, in quotation marks. And we were all like, whoop, that's a red flag. And he just got worse and worse as time went on. And we had this picture of this guy who just he probably dealt drugs and was involved <laughs> in human smuggling. Was the light. And, and nobody ever picked him. He was just like a dead pick the whole way through. It was like, maybe, maybe this time he'll have a redeeming feature. Oh, no, he's even worse. So it's, it's light. It's easy. The rules are super simple. It's a bit of fun and it's quite good to just like you might learn surprising things about people, you know, and their preferences. Everybody learned that um, I've always wanted to date a hairdresser and never had. Mm, so, OK. Um, yep. Yeah, I never will. <laughs> so it, it's a good game. Um, we played Obsession. which We, ah, about we know. Yeah, ha had a <laughs> fantastic time again. Um, we played Tussie Mussy, which I believe I've talked about in the past as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, but I, I I don't remember what you said, but I remember you said stuff. <laughs> the one with drafting flowers. Drafting uh, flowers. And, yes. and you and you get the greens, which are messy, because yeah, one is fun. positive points, but two is negative points. Two or more is negative. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, played on the underground, which is my favourite version of the Ticket to Ride route claiming. Mm -hmm. um, the new edition has London underground on one side and the Berlin underground on the other side. And slightly varied rules for each one. Looks really pretty. It's as good as I as ever. I think it's criminally underrated on Board Game Geek. If you gave me the choice, would you like to play Ticket to Ride or On the Underground? I'm going to play On the Underground every single time because I can get really angry at the passenger for not using my lines. Mm -hmm. And that's fun. Or, and, and, and blocking is way more interesting in it. So um, I, I think maybe at some point I will t possibly talk about that game in more detail if I can find an online copy to play with you guys. Because I, I, I like what it does. And the new version is very, very pretty. That's great. Uh, we, yeah, we played Fjords, the reprint. Um, it's fine. It's absolutely fine. You spend half a game laying out a little map, following some rules, and putting your huts down as your starting points. You spend the other half capturing territory with your little Vikings. It's over within 30 minutes. It's a nice sort of coffee in the afternoon kind of game where you don't have to think too hard about it. It looks really pretty. It has a few extra variant rules and everything. I don't know if I'll ever play it again, but it's okay. Uh, we played Fantasy Realms. Okay. Which yeah, which made reminded me how terrible Red Rising is, <laughs> um, but that's great. Like, the the artwork had everybody like, look at this. What the heck is this? Um, but the game itself was really enjoyable, um, both thematically and mechanically, and it's cheap. So, oh. yep. Uh, we played Brian Baru. Uh, which was brought over. And yeah, and you have to say it's cool because... It was a gigantic flop. Only one no. person really enjoyed themselves. <laughs> uh, my partner hated it. We played it twice. I really did not like it at all. It's Pierre Sylvester's worst um, game as far as I'm concerned. 
like for my tastes. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. We're not. No, you've talked about it in the previous episode. (laughs) You've made your points. We didn't like it. One person enjoyed it. One person said, I might need to play it a bit more to see if I like it. And two of us went, I don't ever want to play that again. So. So, it's just it's fine if you enjoy a game where way, way you, of keeping where you react you. yeah <laughs> no where you react where you react you have no planning you just react to what's happening uh but That's... if you if you have any kind of goal somebody can just stomp on it randomly out of nowhere and it just created a lot of feels bad so i have no a... that, that, that that's not it <laughs> no 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 yeah you you talked about it in the previous episode i'm here to say <laughs> I have a question. Gonna... I have a question yep. based from that. Uh, did you own the? Do you own the game? No. No. So a friend brought it. Yeah. Yeah. It was gifted to a friend, and he really enjoyed it, and the rest of us didn't. So it's a friend that I enjoyed it. Okay, that, that's much better because I was going to say, if it was one of your games, what do you plan to do with it? Ah. Um, if I owned it, I would be a toss-up between trying to sell it on Board Game Geek or wait until the winter and then throwing it into our fire and burning it. To <laughs> that, if that, it did, and to be honest, the... if it didn't sell by the winter, that's what would happen to it. Okay. 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 So, so, so you, so you don't really. I want to move on to a better game. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let, 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 Done. Let, let, Done. Let's move on. I just wanted to know what that, you do when you, you have games. Them you, don't you all. You. <laughs> but, yeah. that was a generic played... question. Yeah, we played a War of Whispers, which we're going to play yep. soon. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it now. Really impressed with it. Just got the shop copy, not the deluxe version. I'm not in. I think the normal version is fantastic. You don't need all the little plastic pieces. Uh, we played Pitch Car Mini, also known as Carabande in France. Pitch Car. Uh, Pitch Car. Yeah. Great. We had yeah. a great time. Just it's just fun flicking like as dexterity flicking games go. It's really enjoyable. Yeah. Although the mini version has a problem that people, everybody, I kept telling everyone, it, it's flick, don't flick as hard as you think you should. These, these are light and still things got fired off the table all the time because people could get into their heads that it's like a little light flick. I think. So the normal version doesn't have that problem, but the normal version's massive. So uh, we played Meeple Circus. Okay. Highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. Balance it is, meeples. Yeah, you balance little circus meeples on top of each other in your own little circle for two rounds. Everybody does it at the same time to a time limit. You have certain goals like get get two people carrying a plank or and balance a ball on it or put uh, put a tiger, not a tiger, put like a horse on top of a ball or an elephant on top of a horse or some, something crazy like that. Uh, and then you have special acts that crop up that mix things up. And then in the final round, uh, everybody goes individually, one at a time, and they have a special challenge. And, uh, and, and Greg, bless him, he picked do the whole thing wearing a blindfold. <laughs> and it was spectacular. It was fantastic. We put on, played the act, we played the metal circus theme, really high energy. And he, he he was like building his little circus off his board, which meant he scored no points. And he didn't even realise he was off the board. Uh, it was, honestly, if you're not sure what it's like, you can watch, I think it's Shut Up and Sit Down and No Pun Included, play Meeple Circus on YouTube and you'll get everything you need to know about it and you'll be like, I need this game. I think it's French and it's brilliant. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um... Last of the ones before I get into the final two that I'm going to put the big stamp on was Sidreal Confluence. Okay. We as a podcast group need to play this so we can talk about it because it's amazing. It's uh, it's building engines, but you everybody has their own card-based engines and their own cards that are space-faring civilization who's all decided we're going to deal with this peacefully through economics uh, and through sharing of ideas not through galactic war. Every, you have to cooperate with everyone, but ultimately there can only be one winner. And it's all about making deals and arrangements. You can trade absolutely anything. You can turn to someone and go, hey, do you want to borrow this bit of my engine, this card for the turn? You know, um, or you can just have this. Or it, And it's trading and it plays up to nine players. It, it's amazing. It's really, really good. So, yeah. Yeah, I l- really enjoyed it. But... The two that I wanted to talk about, uh, we're going to come back to one of them in the future. Uh, finally got to play Dune Imperium. Oh, yeah, it's great. It, 
it 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 absolutely takes a dump on everything that uh, Ruins Varnak was trying to do. Okay, so so we so yeah, we agree on this one. Yeah, we, yes. we can talk yeah, about yeah. Dune Imperium every time. We we, we, <laughs> we will talk about Dune Imperium once I've had a go with the solo get mode, the two player mode, and I've played a bit with the expansion. With the I, of I, expansion, I want, yeah. To, I want to try it someday. I'm so <laughs> impressed. Like Ruins of Arnak for me felt very disjointed, where each section of the board wasn't clicking together, and the deck you were building didn't really do enough. Completely different in Dune Imperium, all felt seamless, all felt like it made thematic and mechanical sense. It felt like there was a ton of different ways to play it. We played it, and then we immediately played it again. Yeah, ninety-seven percent agree. Yeah, it's 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 fantastic, yeah. and I really like that they've gone with painted pieces illustrated you know artwork of the movie so it feels more timeless even though you can look and go oh there's oscar isaac it's uh, <laughs> uh, there's zendaya it's still you know it, it, it feels i can't believe they did that they didn't just take photo stills yeah <laughs> any anyway that the, the imperium is uh, the, the actual worker placement of that year i think two years ago 2020 2019 I think it I really like the track deck construction. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's brilliant. It's yeah. absolutely brilliant. Deck building plus worker placement. Beautiful. Yeah. But the game that I would like to put on the top of the pile just above that was a Kickstarter game I backed merely because I liked the look of the meeples. Oh! oh. Um, and that was... Yes, yes, that game. Uh, Wild Serengeti by Bad Comet. They're a <laughs> South Korean company. This is their first game. They kickstarted it. It's nearly, nearly perfect for what it is. So the concept is you're everybody playing, and you can play this solo, cooperative, or competitive. I've played all three modes. They're all fantastic. Um, you are making a wildlife documentary in the Serengeti. You have a worker that you'll move around to like discover new animals or set up scenes or move animals about on this little grid. And all the animals have this board section, double-sided, two different layouts. And um, you'll like populate the animals onto there through actions. And then you're trying to adjust them and get them on the right piece of terrain, maybe next to a certain other animals or in a straight line or on the correct pieces of terrain or any combination of that. And then you'll claim it with scene cards that score points. Um, it, yeah, it's just so much fun. It's an absolute spectacle on the board. It's got like beautiful wooden pieces linen finished cards gorgeous artwork i, I i'm really impressed uh, this is what this is what i always point out for the kind of thing i want the kickstarter yeah. to be like first time and yeah they looks like everything they've done is going to retail the kickstarter version had um an expansion built into it uh that's one of the few complaints i have is i discovered that the kickstarter expansion cards were not linen finish so you do notice when you pick one up from the expansion. Oh. Compared to normal. Oh, that's a bit sad. But it's a bit sad, but there's room to sleeve them in the box if you want to have them sleeved. Also, you're not you're not really handling them. Like it you're putting them down on the table. So it doesn't make a big difference that the deck card on top of the deck is uh, smooth or linen finished. So it's a it's a minor problem. The bigger one I found is they have a thing called the Rock of Ages. It's got the same problems that the Everdell tree has. It's it's a glorified round track, and it's a big piece that you have to put together. You can't keep it assembled in the box. It gradually breaks as you put it together and take it apart. And I've reached a point now where I just put the two flat sections down, which have the track on it, and just, you know, I don't bother assembling it anymore because, yeah, it's... It's it's not a piece of the spectacle I need when I've got these gorgeous wooden screen printed meeples instead to go ooh about. Um, it's so it it's it's extravagant in a what feels like an environmentally friendly way because there's no plastic at all. The insert is serviceable. Um, it's got wells for everything. It's all made out of cardboard. It's great. I love it. I don't feel the need to buy a replacement insert. This does the job. It'll even do the job sleeved. And it's, um, yeah, yeah, like I, I put a couple of things in baggies and that's it. It packs away beautifully. The game itself is it's most interesting when you kind of click with what you're doing, which is you're constantly sliding pieces around on a puzzle to get everything into the right spots. 
and when you're playing competitive everyone else is doing the same thing so it can get quite hectic but the nice thing is as soon as you've got the scene set up you can just go right i'm going to claim it boom get the points and then i'll go grab some more scenes to fill all of the scenes have little uh, pieces of text at the bottom like a david attenborough style bit of narrative so we played reading those out as you completed the scene um included you know a lot of different facts about various animals which we didn't know so educational Ooh. just yeah just i just loved it if you see it crop up in retail yeah just get it you know the kickstarter expansion thing i think is going to be released as a normal expansion but you really don't need it um it adds a few extra like specialist cards and their specialists give you unique rules to change set up each other you know in future games or anything like that uh but i especially loved it when we played it cooperative because suddenly the game just becomes a group sliding puzzle and you're all sitting there with your own scenes trying to figure out we've got to score this many points on this round and we've got to score this many points by the end of the game and score as much as we can. How can we get everything done with our actions? So I loved it. Really loved it. Um, it is, it's accessible for you know casual players and all the way up to, um, you know, it's fair, it can be fairly complex. Um, hard work at times very frustrating when you see a crocodile sitting on a rock and you need it on um, on a piece of grassland or in a river but yeah yeah i loved it uh and i forgot because there was one where we played uh two of us played radlands which is a two-player dueling game we had a grand time it's really good uh as somebody who plays a lot of two two-player dueling head-to-head -head card games it was interesting and um, I like how small the box is and how easy it is to learn to play. So that was it. I think that should be all 20 games. I might have yeah. counted. <laughs> um, and we'll revisit some of them in the future. Uh, For instance, Brian uh, Boru. Hmm. Well, no, I, 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 now my, my, my focus will be to have you make a good game of Brian Boru. No. no, you can do not, that. You can I, do that. I, I, no, I'm not interested in playing the game again. <laughs> I, if you want me to play Piers Sylvester, I'll go and play the last expedition and I'll have a grand time. And that that game's amazing. But I just, or even the King is Dead. I'll the play king, that. The King is Dead yeah. and the Vier Sindas Volker, Piers Sylvester's yeah. masterpieces. <laughs> I, I just, uh, uh, some games I have a terrible reaction to and I do not enjoy them. <laughs> uh, and Brian Burrow is one of those. I don't, there's, I like the artwork and I like the theming. And that's it. That's I don't like it. the artwork, but okay. Okay, yeah. I can. I can. Enough, that artwork is enough. part of my heritage. It's part of my culture. <laughs> enough. <laughs> enough, Brian. Don't Bottle. fight. Okay. Don't fight. Yes. <laughs> well, the, the only fight here no. is I don't want to talk about it again. Yes. Yeah. Done. No, 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 Didn't no. like it. Alternate opinion. <laughs> Chuck it in the dumpster. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so that's it. Yeah, that is. That's it. That's uh, a talk on conventions and a review of uh, 20 odd games. Well, 19 plus Tiny Towns, but you know all about Tiny Towns. Yep. So, we yeah. Don't talk uh, about tiny towns. We always talk about Tiny Towns. We just, you know. Busy. Yeah, you we've, know. we've already reviewed it. <laughs> I already know. Already reviewed I know. it. I know. <laughs> that, that's not gaslighting. Uh, and that means, on that, uh, we're out of time for this podcast. So, thank you for listening to The Last Dandy. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash The Last Dandy or follow us as The Last Dandy on Twitter or on your preferred podcast app. You can subscribe. You can find us on Board Game Geek, mostly the more active us in the Kingdom Death forum, I think. <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be here next time. So uh, it's farewell from Audrey. Goodbye. And Alessio. Goodbye, I never relent. And myself, finger guns. <laughs> and remember uh, that the second E is standy is for whatever you want it to be. I don't event! This time. Event! That's there you event. go, event. Yeah. <laughs> event. <laughs>